right, we're going to get started. So I want to, first of all, thank everybody for joining the AVNEA webinar. This is our eighth webinar that we've had over the last 12 months or so. And we do definitely appreciate everybody taking the time to, to join the webinar. Today's webinar, um, we, we have uh, two different professors. We have Professor Marcus Crane, uh, who will first be talking to us about, the, about treating the bicuspid valves with AVNEO. So many of you are uh, advanced users, have been doing AVNEO cases. We have more than 100 surgeons around the world doing AVNEO procedures. Uh, and one of the requests that I get quite often is a, a bit more of an advanced training. So today's uh, webinar is really designed to be about advanced training. So I know we have a number of people that are uh, are new users or have not started the AVNEO yet, uh, we will continue to have some more uh, basic kind of training of the step-by-step -step and et cetera. Uh, but today's training is really designed to be a bit more advanced. And Dr. Crane will talk to us about treating bicuspid patients, uh, which we have a, a large number, especially in the non-elderly patients, we have a large number of bicuspid valves that we have to repair. So. Um, Professor Crane will talk about that. And then after that, um, D Professor Bakhatsvili uh, from Georgia will, will talk about uh, a couple of case studies that he's done where he's, he's treated patients with infective endocarditis uh, using AVNEO, which is uh, a little bit different than what Professor Crane has done. So I think it'll be quite interesting to hear both of these presentations. And um, First off, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Marcus Crane. Uh, Professor Crane is the Deputy Director, Adult Cardiovascular Surgery, and he's also the head of the Institute Insure at the German Heart Center in Munich, Germany. So I would like to ask um, Dr. Crane to uh, take over. Yeah, Damon, thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me sufficiently. I will try to share my screen to start with my presentation. So can you see that, Damon? Is that? Yes, I can. That's fine. So as Damon mentioned, um, today we are talking about uh, the treatment of bicuspid valves using AVNEO. Um, to this end, I would start with a little bit of general background of uh, bicuspid aortic valve and then talking about technical aspects how to do the um, AV-NEO procedure in bicuspid aortic valve morphology. And at the end, I would like to talk a little bit about um, when to repair a bicuspid aortic valve and when to reconstruct uh, as doing AV-NEO in these patients. So first of all, uh -huh. so, no, um, I can't, so no, nothing to, um, no um, conflict of interests, um, except that I'm a proctor for JRMDD and a proctor for Peter Dusik for this AVNEO technology. So how often does an bicuspid aortic valve occur? So the incidence is one to 2%. So one or two out of 100 people are suffering or have a bicuspid morphology. What are the various complications which patients can suffer from? And here we have a huge variety of incidences. So in a bicuspid aortic valve morphology, 15 to 70% of the patients will suffer from an aortic stenosis. Only one to 3% will suffer from aortic regurgitation. And infective endocarditis will happen between 10 and 40% of the patients and 5% of the patients will have or develop an aortic dissections. So just that you have uh, some numbers in mind how often we will be um, confronted with a bicuspid aortic valve and what are the typical complications in these patients. So how should aortic valve, a bicuspid aortic valve, valve be classified? Um, the most popular classification comes from Sivas et al. 
and he classified the morphology following these uh, three types. A type zero has just two commissures, and I hope you can see my arrow, just two commissures. A type one has one Rafi, that's the definition of that, but two open commissures. And the type two has two Rafis and just one open commissure in this morphology. There's a subclassification which could be used for the type zero, that means the orientation of the coronary ostia. So in the lateral type, both coronary osteas, one is on the one side and the other is on the other side of the two leaflets. The other one is um, that you have the anterior posterior, posterior configuration where you have two commissures, but both coronary ostea are on one leaflet side. If you go for a subclassification of the type one bicuspidal aortic valve morphology, it depends on where the raphi is sitting. So is that between the left and the right, or the right and the non, or the non and the left coronary cusp? So this type of subclassification could be done, and it's helpful to talk to each other um, that we can have an idea how the valve looks like and describe that uh, properly. So here's an example coming from the original publication from Sievers et al. For example, here you have a type one bicuspid aortic valve with one Rafi. It's sitting here, as you can imagine. And here you have two commissures which are able to fully open. On the opposite, you have here an example for a type two bicuspid aortic valve. And you can see one Rafi here and one Rafi here. And only this commissure from the left to the non-coronary cusp is able to fully open. Here's an example for a type zero. So no Rafi and two commissures, which are more or less able to open in this kind of morphology. So this is something we have to have in mind. Also, um, if we are talking later on how to do the um, AV neo procedure in this kind of patients because it's diff it's different to treat it. So what is about the age distribution in the surgical population? And this is also the original publication from Zivas et al. coming from 2007. And you can see that the majority of patients suffering from a bicuspid aortic valve and are presenting for surgery are younger than 60 years. So what we are doing is, if we are talking about bicuspid aortic valve patients, we are in general talking about young patients. So what kind of treatment modalities do we have to treat this kind of patients in general, either if they are suffering from a stenosis or if they are suffering from an insufficiency? So of course we can do aortic valve replacement, surgical aortic valve replacement, using either a mechanical or a biological procedures, and you can do that for both for stenosis and insufficiency. If you have an insufficient valve, of course, you can do another strategy. You can try to repair the bicuspid aortic valve, and this is something what you can see down here. This is not possible or usually not possible in the stenotic or you have a new treatment modality with AV-NEO, and AV-NEO could be done in both. It could be done in a stenotic aortic valve, bicuspid aortic valve, or in an insufficient uh, bicuspid aortic valve. So what are the limitations of doing um, biological aortic valve replacement in this cohort? So as we have seen previously, Bicuspid aortic valve patients are young patients. So we are talking about this age class between, let's say, 20 and 60 years. And in this publication from Bonjon from 2015, you can see that the freedom from reoperation, the freedom from event, was much worse in this young population compared to older age classes. And 50% of the patients has to 
undergo reoperation after a time of around 17 years. We have looked at our own data comparing two different or consisting out of two different prosthetic valves, the paramount valve and the trifecta valve. And as you can see, also for our population, the same, the same was true. So patients be below 50 years, after 15 years, we have a freedom from reoperation of around 30%. And in a patient who is between 50 and 65, we have a freedom from reoperation uh, after 15 years, around 50%. So biological procedures has a problem of degeneration. Mechanical procedures, on the other end, has a problem, if you can have can see this here, of a high incidence of bleeding risk, but a low incidence of reoperation risk. But the bleeding risk, as all of you know, um, is present. So a possible alternative could be the AV Neo procedure. Uh, 2011, Professor Ozaki first time published his um, procedure. So the procedure to reconstruct an aortic valve with autologous pericardium is not new at that time. But what he did is um, an amazing body of work to standardize the procedure that everybody is able to learn that and adapt that to his technologies. So how does the experience at the German Heart Center Munich looks like in general? So far until September, 2020, this is the, the last time we did an analysis of our data, was that we operated on more than 150 patients. The mean age was 53 years. And as you can see here, because of this young age, a lot of patients has a bicuspid morphology, 125 or more than 80%. Concomitant procedures have been done in 63 or 40% of the patients and um, permanent pacemaker implantation, implantation after the procedure was not necessary at that time. Survival rates were quite good. So we have data now up to four years and we have a survival, we just lost three patients over this time. Freedom from reoperation was also quite good with a mean freedom of reoperation of almost 95% after up to four years. Mean pressure gradients were quite low with a mean pressure gradient in this cohort coming from 150 patients of 8.4 millimeter mercury. And this key, um, stays more or less constant over time, up to three years. The same was true for the effective orifice area of 2.3 uh, square centimeter, which ends up after three years with above two square centimeter of, um, with 2.1 square centimeter at three years. So let's focus on the AV Neo and bicuspid aortic valve because what I have shown you so far comes not only from patients suffering from a bicuspid aortic valve, it, um, this was the data of the overall population. So 152 patients, 125 have been had, have had a bicuspid aortic valve morphology. 22 has as a primary um, um, vitium uh, regurgitation, and 103, so 80 percent out of that population uh, presented with an aortic valve stenosis. What is the goal? So coming to the technical aspects and these kind of patients, what is the goal? The goal is a symmetric tricuspidization of the aortic valve. And this means if you are sizing for your leaflets, it is only allowed or should be recognized that you have only one size difference for the new leaflets. This means if you have 25, a 27, and a 27 leaflet sized. So go for that. If you have a sizing of 25, 29, and 29, you should go for a neo commissure. And by creating neo commissures, you can go and achieve a symmetric aortic valve at the end. So what that means is take your time for sizing. 
this is very, very important to be able to create a symmetric aortic valve at the end. So here you can see an example of a heavily calcified aortic valve. This is excised. You can see the measurement of the annulus is 22. And here you can see the sizing. So the left coronary cusp is 27. The right coronary cusp is 25, and you have a 25 in the non-coronary cusp. So this is, um, this is a sizing which you can accept. It's just one size difference, and you can go for these leaflet sizes. Here you have another example. This is a bicuspid aortic valve type two. You can see one wafer here, and the other wafer was down here. And here you have a 27 for the non-coronary cusp. You have a 29 for the left coronary cusp and a 25 for the right coronary cusp. So this is not very symmetric. And in this cases, we should go for a neocommission. You can see that here. Then you have a 27 there. Here's the original commissure. Here's the new one. And you have a symmetric distribution of your leaflets at the end. We will come to that uh, later on in a, in a longer video to explain that anymore, a little bit more in detail. So AV neo and bicuspid aortic valve, how does that work in the different types of morphology? Remember our type zero. There we have two uh, morphologies um, with respect to the coronaries. Why? We have the lateral type and we have the anterior prostate. And if you have here ah. uh, the lateral type, one ostia is at one leaflet, the other is at the other one. So what you do to create a tricuspid aortic valve out of that you have one reference of a native um, commissure, and you have to create by sizing two neo commissures. And by doing that, then you can implant three leaflets of the correct size. The most difficult one, as you can imagine, is this morphology. Because in this morphology, it could happen that it works that you have to go for three neocommissures, which is very, very difficult. What is about a type one? In a type one, we have one wafi. The usual or the mainly present type is the type which has the wafi between the left and the right coronary cusp. So in this case, you also keep this um, commissure for orientation, you keep the native commissure. You also, in most cases, can keep the commissure between the non and the white coronary cusp, because usually the non coronary cusp is the largest cusp in this kind of bicuspid aortic valve. And then what you have seen in the video before, you will go for the neo commissure and create a larger left coronary cusp by putting away the commissure from the native commissure here more into the sinus of the non-coronary cusp. And by that, you will achieve a symmetric tricuspid aortic valve. So how to do that? How to create a neocommissure? Um, and here it, it is another view. You have your three sinuses and as you can see, this sinus is much larger, usually the non-coronary sinus, and this is usually the left coronary sinus. By creating a, so usually you start your reconstruction at the nadir, so the lowest part of the sinus. By creating a neocommissure, you move these um, starting point from this presentation more to the left, closer to this commission. So you're starting here in your left coronary sinus, more to the commission, 
you, your suturing line is below the native commissure and you come up again, creating here the neocommissure and have the new nadir of the non-coronary cusp also moved away from the native commissure. By that, your new commissure, your neocommissure is sitting next to the native one. I hope this is, um, you can understand that. So for that purpose here, you can see another movie. This is a little bit longer to explain that a little bit more in detail. So we have a 25 in the, in the left coronary cusp. We have had a 31 in the non-coronary cusp and a 29 in the cusp of the right coronary artery. For that reason, we used a 27 for the left coronary cusp. We measured a 29 for the non-coronary cusp after moving the commissure a little bit into the non-coronary sinus. Now I try to mark the suturing line below the native commissure. And then you start suturing from the new nadir, let's say it like that. And here you can see the white coronary cusp is already implanted. The first commissure is done. And then this is important. This is the native commissure and your suture line is below this native commissure, as you can see here. The principal procedure is the same. You are suturing your dots from the leaflet. In the beginning, the distance is a little bit closer. And once you are passing the native commissure, you go upwards on your line, which you have drawn, as you can see here. Then you have to do the rest of the stitches in the aortic wall because this will be your new neocommission. Also the pre-last stitch is a big bite. This could end up already in the native commission like here. And then it's the same. This is the last stitch. Here was the commissure. Here is the native commissure. And then you have the 29 because this is now smaller and you are creating the new, the new commissure. Here is now your Nadir to start. Here's already the end for the other one. And then it's really the same procedure, just implanting the leaflets following your new lines as you did that usually. This is a pre-last stitch and here is also the pre-last stitch from the other leaflet. And I try to put these already at the same height usually. And then you can see the last stitch. And after that, you are creating your commissure at, as usual. The rest is as usual, just penetrating both leaflets with the additional suture and try to get the configuration as you usually get that. And then you have your final valve at the end and here is the original commissure and you 
can see that you have a more symmetric valve by moving the new commissure towards the non coronary cusp. <clears throat> so let's focus for the last minutes on AV neo in insufficient bicuspid aortic valves. So when to the question is when to repair a valve and when perhaps it's better to resect the native aortic valve and go for something like reconstruction or even replacement. So the question is repair or reconstruction? Advantages of aortic valve repair, of course, are a long-term durability. So the native valve, there's nothing better than that. Low risk of, for endocarditis, perhaps we will hear a little bit more about that later on. The native valve usually has an excellent hemodynamic. No permanent anticoagulation is also needed uh, after aortic valve repair. And by that, you have an improved quality of life. So, but there are some limitations of aortic valve repair. And um, these limitations are very nicely worked out by the group from Schaefer's. So here's one example, a degree of the, um, of the commissures which are able to open of less than 160 degree. This is a risk factor as shown by this group for reoperation. So another problem is, beside of the orientation, the aortic valve dimension. So an annulus above 29 or equal to above 29 also leads to a higher degree of reoperation, a higher rate of reoperation. Another problem seems to be the use of any kind of patch material. So they compared also a group of aortic valve repair patients with no pericardial patch implantation and a group which has implanted any kind of pericardial patch material. And as you can see here, the outcome was much worse. The same was published by our group uh, last year. So as soon as you need to implant any kind of patch material because you have to resect the RAFI or whatever, and um, reconstruct that by patch implantation, the outcome in bicuspid aortic valves is very poor. So in this case, AV Neo possible, could be possible an alternative treatment option. And for that, we uh, try to evaluate in our patients. So you have seen in the beginning, we have treated 22 patients who has mainly an aortic regurge with AV Neo and compared that to our 61 patients, bicuspid aortic valve patients who underwent repair. So these two populations, the data are so far unpublished. So you are the first to hear about that. So 61 patients are underwent aortic valve repair, 22 patients underwent AV Neo. So the degree of regurg was much higher in the group of AV Neo. So the, um, the uh, underlying vitium was much more severe in this group. The peak gradient was 15 to 16 in the repair group and 21 preoperative peak gradient was 21 in the AV Neo group. And it differed a little bit regarding the mean gradient. So the mean gradient was already a little bit higher preoperatively in the AV Neo group. That reflects a little bit the strategy that if we have something like a RAFI, which is a little bit calcified, which has to be resected or something like that, um, that we have a little bit a higher gradient in the AV Neo group. But the effective orifice area in both groups were absolutely identical. Ejection fraction was identical, left um, end diastolic diameter was identical, and the size of the annulus was also identical in both groups. But if you compare the early hemodynamic, which you can achieve by repairing a bicuspid aortic valve, and if you do so, you 
end up with two leaflets at the end, which has this fish mole configuration at the end. Or if you replace or reconstruct the valve by autologous pericardium with three leaflets, which uh, has a symmetric orientation, then you can achieve a much better hemodynamic. Here is given the time of discharge and the mean pressure gradient. And you have here mean pressure gradient in this aortic valve repair group above 10. So it's around 12 to 13 millimeter mercury. And in the same group or a comparable group after AV neo, you have a mean pressure gradient. It's something around five millimeter mercury. So the early hemodynamics seems to be much better in this kind of patients. And we compared the effective orifice area. As I mentioned preoperatively, between the repair group and the AV neo group, there was for the effective orifice area, there was no difference with 2.9. If you compare that at discharge, the AV neo repair group goes a little bit down with the opening area because of the repair strategies which are needed to get a competent aortic valve. On the opposite, the AV neo group has a significantly larger effective orifice area at the end because of tricuspidization. So with this, I would like to summarize my talk. So bicuspid aortic valve is not a rare malformation. It appears in one to two out of 100 people. So uh, perhaps one of our group who is listening today will suffer from a bicuspid aortic valve. Bicuspid aortic valve patients are usually be below the age of 60 years at time of surgery. Biological procedures have an impaired long-term durability in this patient population. AV neo could be an alternative in these patients. The definitely goal for AV neo has to be symmetric tricuspidization. Don't go for two leaflets. Every time go for a symmetric tricuspidization. Symmetric tricuspidization often, but not always, needs creation of a neocompression. Tricuspid AV neo shows improved hemodynamic compared to bicuspid aortic valve repair, as I have shown you at the end. With this, I'm at my end. And I'm open for questions if you want to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Conner. That was an excellent talk. As, as always, I, I learned quite a bit again from, from you. So I do definitely ap appreciate that. Dr. Bakhatsvili, um, do you want to make some comments, please? Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Krane for a beautiful presentation. And for, thank you for sharing so unique uh, materials, which he has for a uh, baby because to, with a treating of the because with the aortic valve. And uh, we know that it's uh, this, as he told already, this. Uh, Bicuspid aortic valve, it, it is occurs in, in about 2% of population, but it's, uh, it's, it has more tendency to, to have, to be, it became the stenotic or to, for fail. So it is a real uh, problem for, uh, you know, uh, population. So it's, uh, there is good solution for people who, uh, would like who is younger and who is not you know, like to have uh, uh, warfarin treatment in whole, whole during whole life. So this uh, neo uh, tricotubization is a uh, good good and for my point of view a favorite method for the patients with bicuspid valve. So. And then again, congratulations one more time. So I have a couple uh, one question when uh, to Dr. Krane, Professor Krane, that uh, when, uh, as you described, there is when it's type O uh, position of the bicuspid aorta, uh, aortic valve, 
then uh, in, uh, in some position, it's happened then a suture line, it's passed uh, more than half of suture line pass out of uh, aortic um, uh, fibrotic leak, ring. And uh, sometimes if it's bulbous is a little bit aneurysmatous, um, does not make its uh, uh, discomfort to, to make so long line of out of fibrotic leak. Because in last week I had such a case when I promised to young guy to do Ozaki procedure. It was uh, type zero, but when I took out this uh, uh, calcified valve, uh, it's, uh, for me it was uh, not comfortable feeling to make so big line as a two new commissures and also uh, two new nadir to, to make this um, whole tricostridization. Finally, I uh, switched to mechanical valve. Patient was not so much <laughs> happy afterwards, but but I I try to do best for him. And this is one question. And uh, and uh, uh, ah, so it's this is my question, please. So. You are absolutely right. Um, the type zero morphology, and I'm very happy about the fact that this is the rare morphology within the bicuspid aortic valve scenario, um, often leads to a long suturing line out of the annulus. And it is sitting in the part below the annulus in the myocardial part, this suturing line, which is sometimes not very strong. And I have to say we have, I guess, four failures intraoperatively, where we switched, as you described, to mechanical or biological aortic valve replacement within the same procedure, because these kind of valves are the most difficult ones to end up with the tricuspid aortic valve on the same height at the end, having the commission, the neo commissures, we see one uh, native commissure. So these are definitely the most difficult valves to treat. Another problem in this type zero configuration is especially in the configuration when both coronary osteas are on the same leaflet side. So then you have often a conflict that you do not have enough space between both ostea to create this neocommissure not coming too close to one of the ostea. So in these cases, I would definitely recommend go for replacement. This is an, a nicely established strategy to treat patients. And this is really, really difficult to do. Thank you very much. I take opportunity to uh, to ask another question. With uh, you have a big experience with the tricuspidization, so which place, where, where, as you told, you have four failures of the uh, during the operation, and which place is it nadir or commissure most uh, uh, fragile place for this uh, uh, tricuspidization? Hmm. Um, in, we had happens in, mostly is this problem. Yeah, and in none of the cases I can tell you exactly. So we, we did the reconstruction, followed the rules, but we have had in all converted cases something like an insufficiency of a degree two. So that's why we decided for a second one to convert. Um, and I have Unfortunately, I have to, to say, I do not have learned so much that I can say, oh, I did this completely wrong. It doesn't look good. Um, here, the stitch was bad or the commissure was wrong. The sizing was wrong. Perhaps the number is too low to, to tell you something about that. We, ju we just recognized the result wasn't good. And in this case is, of course, for the patient's sake, we, we switch to a procedures. But if you 
If you compare that to our general number today, we have probably something like 170 cases because the analysis, which I have showed to you, was from September last year and we converted four. So it's not a high, high number. So usually we can say the, um, uh, the treatment is successful in more than 90% of the cases, 95. Thank you very much for uh, absolutely competent, confident answer for my questions. And I, I like to congratulate again for the, your beautiful results of the recruitization. I would like to comment. It's a also. difficult word, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's very difficult word, absolutely. So I would like to comment also. It's uh, I, I have uh, also uh, it's experience with uh, Avenel and uh, with the uh, tricuspidization also, but not so much. And I would <clears throat> like make comment that for people who is a beginner for the RNL that I, I would advise that to do in beginning the cases only with tricuspid uh, anatomy to, to have less conversions for uh, replacement of the aorta because with experience sometimes uh, I had no conversion until now but Sometimes I was just lucky to, <laughs> to have no conversion. After, after operation, I understood that it is, so in the beginning, this experience was, um, does not allow to uh, manage difficult cases. But fortunately, it was not so zero types who, who, who patient who like to have um, uh, Ozaki procedure or uh, this anatomical side uh, moments was not so difficult. And only one, one that uh, it was in last week when I looked and even I do, did not start it to switch the uh, pericardial patches because it was for my uh, position, it was uh, not good candidate for the uh, this our, our procedure. And uh, I congratulate once more again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Professor Krone. Thank you, Dr. Bakatsvili. Um, there are several questions for you, Professor Krone. I think we'll, I'm gonna hold the questions until after Dr. Bakatsvili uh, does his presentation, uh, but there are, because there are kind of general um, questions that people are asking. So we'll come, come back to all those questions after Bakatsvi, Dr. Bakatsvili presents. So Dr. Up to you. Yeah. So, Dr. Bakatsvili, are you ready to present, sir? Yes, yes, I, I hope I'm ready. Okay, so just before, while Dr. Bakatsvili is getting his, his slides prepared, um, I just want to explain a little bit. So, Dr. Bakatsvili uh, has been doing the AV Neo now, I think, since 2015, I think you started. 16. 16. It's in June, it will be five years already. Five years. And um, time is running. Time, yeah, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, Dr. Bakatsvili, you know, sees a, a tremendous number of very complicated cases. And uh, he explained to me that he's done a couple of patients with uh, infective endocarditis. Uh, so I thought it would be very interesting for the attendees to, to hear his perspective and how he how he treats those patients. So that's why we've uh, asked Dr. Bakatsvili to, uh, to present a couple of case studies. So Dr. Bakatsvili, are you able to share your screen now? Um, yes, it, it's uh, able to just share. Is it okay? Mm, it's coming up, yes. Okay, looks yes, good, okay. thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, hello again, everybody. So it is honor for me to have the opportunity of sharing my experience with you. Um, now this is uh, oh, how to go. Okay, I have no conflict of interest to disclosure. Then uh, shortly, I <clears throat> like to speak about back endocarditis. This is uh, uh, 
uh, have, it was first described by French physician Lazare Rivier more than 350 years ago. The infection affects the endocardial surface of the heart, most commonly the valves, but also may occur in neural endocardium and cardiac septal defect and so. Uh, the current name of this infection, infective endocarditis, was popularized in the 1960s by Lernier and Weinstein to cover other possible but infrequent etiologies in addition to the bacterial infection. Uh, infective, <clears throat> uh, infective endocarditis is a fatal disease with a high uh, incidence of the approx uh, approximately 310 per 100,000 of the population, uh, uh, overall 40 or 50 percent of patients who uh, uh, require surgical treatment. Despite of improvement of the uh, <clears throat> Management, uh, infective endocarditis remains the deadly disease associated with the in-hospital mortality of um, 15 to up to 50% of patients requiring cardiac surgery. Uh, standard uh, indications for surgery is uh, severe heart failure, severe heart valve dysfunction, prosthetic valve disinfections, invasion being to the valve leaflets, recurrent systemic embolization, large mobile vegetation, persist sepsis despite adequate antibiotic therapy for more than five, seven days. Um, the guidelines emphasize that uh, once the indication for surgery is established, the operation should be performed as soon as possible. Uh, and, uh, Con uh, concerning of the subject of the, our webinar, below I will be discuss only aortic valves. Um, uh, no, sorry, I need to switch slides. Made the main choice of the valve replacement uh, are prosthetic valves and autologous homograph. A homograph may be beneficial in aortic valve prosthesis, endocarditis when perianular abscess or extensive destruction of anatomical structure has occurred. This is uh, by ATS uh, guidelines. Um, the application of allograft and homograft is limited by poor availability of the uh, and with the difficult techniques. So, but once more again about uh, treatment, which preferable of course to re repair uh, valves if it's possible, but if not possible, it's, it should be replaced. And again, if uh, prosthetic endocarditis, it's better to make uh, it's proved who has experience to use homographs. What now, what to do is, uh, well, uh, Biological valve or mechanical, there is big discussion in in whole world, and um, the choice of the uh, valve remains controversial. Uh, and uh, uh, some studies have found no significant difference in uh, in survival uh, between uh, survival between biological valve and mechanical valves. But there are also some studies reporting that the survival rate with biological valve is inferior to mechanical. Present, presently, there are no randomized controlled trials of meta-analysis studies compared to prognosis of biological valves with the of mechanical valves. The task force for the management of infective endocarditis of the 2000 uh, in of the 2015 European Society of Cardiology does not support any specific valve substitute, but uh, to uh, but recommends to tailor it approach for each individual patients and clinical solution. While by STS, while cho choice should be based upon age, life expectancy, comorbidities, and then compli compliance with anticoagulant therapy. So, uh, 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 so now, uh, as we see, these both valves are not uh, ideal. So, at least, uh, it's uh, uh, there is um, uh, 
interest to the, and the high interest of this uh, you know, use in back endocarditis of uh, you know, uh, new procedure, as they say, Ozaki procedure to, to treat the patients. Um, um, in the beginning of the, uh, uh, in October of the, the 2018, there was one patient who was transferred to my hospital with uh, uh, in the, uh, endocarditis, uh, and, um, but um, uh, it was uh, difficult to make decision uh, which valve to use for, for treatment of these patients. So, uh, and um, I have two uh, experience of 26 uh, uh, RNA procedures, uh, Ozaki technique, and uh, two articles, one from Ozaki himself and another one from uh, uh, Okada, who in this both article, the, uh, this, this authors uh, described how to treat patients with autologous pericardium. So you know, finally, Uh, so where the diagnosis was confirmed and only right way to save life was emergency surgery for this time. Uh, and as I told, my experience was 26 cases. Uh, uh, so decision was made and auto autologous pericardium uh, uh, was taken in standard way after the median sternotomy. The aortic wall was tricuspid with calcified leaflets and moderate stenosis and with perforation of the right and left cusps. On the aortic wall, we were floated vegetation, six, seven millimeters length and abscess cavity we are located in the right and left wall sour stenosis with a diameter about 20, 20 millimeters, millimeters. The wall leaflets were uh, excised and aortic annulus was claimed from debris materials. After, uh, uh, after antiseptic treatment of the aortic annulus was first performed the patch closure of the abscess cavity and after Ozaki procedure with and after only Ozaki procedure with autologous pericardium. Post-operative post prognosis was unventful after one month of the antibiotic therapy. Trivial aortic regurgitation preserved and preserved ejection fraction were observed at uh, discharge, uh, um, no recurrence of infection or advanced uh, events were observed at two and a half years postoperatively. And EHOC cardiography demonstrated that aortic regurgitation was mild, but preserved left ventricular and ejection fraction. One year later, uh, I operated similar case with two abscesses also in a root of the aorta. This was uh, treated uh, by, uh, this was uh, in this uh, table you see, this was the third patient who has operated uh, in, on sept in September 2020. It was for 44 years man. But before also I, I operated one patient also with back endocarditis, uh, uh, it, about one year ago it was, uh, he, uh, he came with pulmonary edema transferred from regional hospital with uh, three months of anamnesis of uh, infection, infective endocarditis. Investigation proof infective endocarditis diagnosis, severe regurgitation on the aortic wall with big vegetations. Severe regurgitation, mitral wall of uh, 3A by Carpentier and small ASD. Patient for the dematose with, be, with a, a bad respiratory parameters and uh, bad prognosis. So, after in, so we decide to treat him the, the, uh, uh, and after intensive treatment in intensive care unit uh, condition is soon compensated. I, sug I suggested to this pay, uh, to a shorter operation with replacement uh, uh, of aortic wall and um, mitral repair, but patient who was uh, he, who is our colleague insisted on Ozaki 
instead of mechanical valve. The patient was 55 years old at that time. It was done mitral valve plasty with annuloplasty ring and Ozaki. And the uh, fourth and last case, it was done just uh, three days ago. It is a chronic infective endocarditis. Um, this uh, patient with chronic, uh, which was manifested after COVID infection uh, two months ago. So was done regular avenue of, after operation during a night, uh, during operating night was extubated and he's doing well now on the world of the, our unit. Uh, this uh, is this table where now you can see uh, patient dates. Uh, most all of them we are males, uh, and one first case was done urgently because he was uh, uh, terribly de decompensated, and it was the only way to um, go for urgent sur surgery. Uh, second and third ward um, we treated two and three days before operation, and last one was semi-elective. Uh, uh, Preoperative assessments were ejection fractions were mildly inferred, uh, and uh, a little bit bigger with uh, uh, enlarged left ventricle uh, diameter also. Uh, all of them have uh, severe regurgitation on the aorta, and only first one was regurgitation with stenosis, and there were also calcifications. Uh, intraoperative dates. Uh, I, I described the uh, sizes of the uh, leaflets. It's it, as, you, as we see, it's not a small root end. Most of the used the size was 29. Um, and, and two of them had abscesses of the aorta with, con uh, with uh, concomitant procedure. One had mitral plasty, and only one last one was just poor uh, Ozaki procedure. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, you can, we can see uh, uh, also cross clamp time, which is of course a shorter on last case. Uh, uh, organism of the cause organism of the you know, endocarditis first was the gem was negative. Uh, from habits, first one was a smoke. He was smoker and diabetes. Um, in second case, we get got. Candida infection, uh, candida from the gem, but postoperatively he went uh, normally. Uh, and this second patient has, uh, he was uh, yeah, intravenous, the drug addicted patient, and there uh, is a uh, heavy smoker. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus was uh, in gem of the fourth third patient. For fourth one, we uh, had no results until now, and second, third one was also uh, C positive hepatitis. Uh, post operative dates, okay, follow up. Um, this was uh, preserved left ventricle, as we see, and a little bit uh, improved after, after operation. Uh, regurgit regurgitation for first patient is uh, mild to moderate, and uh, all three other patients are uh, aortic are quite competent with the symbolic mean gradient on the aorta. Uh, so, no need to have pacemaker, no redo uh, until now for these patients. Um, so, and the follow up. It's uh, 29 months for first patients follow up, uh, one year for second one, and uh, you see the third one is just half year and a uh, uh, few days. Uh, regurgitant area, it was a little bit uh, increased and in, 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 in first case, it is mild to moderate regurgitation, um, but uh, no heart insufficiency and third one. By my opinion, this is uh, connected with abscesses of the root, maybe uh, postoperatively. This uh, makes uh, some deformation of the ring uh, and it causes a little bit more regurgitation with, uh, than with, uh, with uh, regular patients. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this root abscess is um, uh, 
uh, echo record we lost because was uh, update of the soft update was done on the our echo machine but i i uh, took um, last case uh, records of the this few which i did for a few days ago we you see this pre-operative uh, <clears throat> uh, transfers of agile uh, uh, view uh, uh, this is the severe, severe aortic regurgitation, uh, and uh, now how to oh, next one. This is a different view with put color Doppler. Next, and now you see after <clears throat> uh, you see this. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this, okay. You see this high cooptation of the neo uh, neo uh, leaflets, and um, with color Doppler, there's practically trace of the regurgitation or no regurgitation. Uh, uh, next one. Okay, this is from aortic. Uh, view from the aortic side and this is an m mode you see opening and the close of the aortic wall and uh, uh, so in summary uh, Autologous pericardium fixed in glutaral dehyde can be infected as easily as a bioprothesis uh, bioprosthetic valve, but the risk is less than synthetic showing a cuff. Infective endocarditis has a poor prognosis when the prosthetic valve is infected. Considering the prosthetic valve infection and redo operation, Aveneo may be considered among young patients. The advantage of AVNO is no sewing cuff, which makes redo operation much easier. Uh, conclusions, AVNO <clears throat> is safe and effective method for an infective aortic wall replacement with good short and midterm results. Uh, uh, AVNO also could be considered for Aortic root abscesses as an alternative to allograft. Avenue low gradient is a positive point in the recovery of the stressed myocardium. And last one, no necessity to use warfarin makes patient, patients postoperative life safer and better and cuts off the hospital days. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to remember anatomy of the smile because this is concerning of the COVID infection. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bak Bakatsvili. Bakhutashvili. Bakhutashvili. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I will get it right one, one of these no, no days. No problem, I, no problem. I will, I will get it right. Please. Dr. B. Dr. No, B. it's good. Uh, Professor yeah. Krane, would you like to uh, make a couple of comments? Yes, thank you very much for sharing this fantastic experience. Um, so I, on my, my own, uh, never did an AV neo procedure in an endocarditis patient. So I have uh, no experience with that. How, how does that work? Um, when, when we started with the procedure in our hospital, we... Um, excluded these patients in the beginning because we would like to have a, a, a patient population which is more or less um, comparable and homogene that we can draw some uh, conclusions at the end. That's why we, we just exclude that. So this is what one reason. The other reason is that um, from my point of view, the, the concept from Professor Ozaki is to preserve the native aortic valve wing uh, because this is um, an important part of the hemodynamic in this situation. And as soon as you have to uh, put in some patched material into the AV wing, um, then this changes a little bit. And you on your own, you stated that perhaps a certain 
amount of degree of regurgitation after avenue could be due to um, the patch implantation at that part. Um, and I have one general question. So, because we are discussing that at the moment in our hospital a lot, uh, and perhaps the audience has also an answer to that question too. Um, we, we are seeing an increase in endocarditis patients over the last one and two years, we have to say. So endocarditis from the native aortic valve as well as from prosthetic aortic valves. I don't know if, if you have the same feeling that uh, especially during the last, let's say 10 to 20 months, numbers in endocarditis, at least at our hospitals, is definitely significantly increasing. So this is my, my first question. And the, the second question goes to you because of the wing reconstruction, which you have to do, which feeling do you have for that? Um, should we go for that in general? Uh, Dr. Carney, Professor Carney, thank you for uh, questions, for your assessment of my speech. Okay, first of all, of course, this tendency we can feel in whole of the world that this is increasing number of the endocarditis. It's, uh, this is maybe just, just general opinion, maybe it's increase of use of uh, antibiotics without necessity or this is a problem is which goes much far from it's more most more general than a cardiac surgery but uh, this uh, it and it uh, it could be uh, connected with uh, immune uh, immune response of the patients also and uh, this number of patients is becoming more and such a two ups, this uh, two patients from uh, my four experience to, to have as huge, quite huge abscesses in the road. And um, uh, if not aortic regurgitation, they we are practically no, no symptomatic. This is not high fever, no general signs of this so such a severe infection. So I think this, uh, this is a, again connected with uh, uh, immune response of the patients um, and um, what, what to do. The, uh, I agree that uh, homograft could be better solution for such a patients, but in some countries it's, it's not available and uh, uh, there is no experience of for many surgeons too. So, I, uh, if we say it's for bicuspid valve or just for generally for valve replacement, this uh, uh, Ozaki procedure is uh, just uh, discussing question with patient who would like who would prefer to have biological valve, mechanical valve, or or uh, avenero. In case of the, this back endocarditis with abscesses of root. Uh, this is just the feasibility of the country or clinic or surgeon who is able to do homograft and who is not able to, uh, the, if, if that is if, uh, not possible to have a homograft, I think this, uh, what I, uh, was done in my case, it was the best solution in concrete patient and in, in uh, developing countries, especially where is no, absolutely no possibility to get such a uh, material. And if there would be more materials, it's just uh, two, two and a half years from first patient. Let to see how it will go. Maybe we could get some unique material when we can compare with the homograph uh, late uh, midterm and late results. We, to judge just with two and three cases, it is not serious uh, in our field, of course. I don't know if I answer exactly your uh, question. Yeah, it, it's fine, it's fine. So. Um, another question would be, how many cases did you in total so far? Totally. I will know is uh, 87, but uh, four is 87. from uh, 
infective endocarditis. Yes, and do you have had a patient who um, have an endocarditis after AV neo? Uh, because no, we have seen me. a couple of them. Yes, uh, in uh, when we met, uh, okay, it's good. It was good time when we are at the where. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, I'm worried, long time ago, but <laughs> I'm worried again about the time when we met. It was it is a single patient when I I have a, okay totally I have a, two redo cases. One was uh, this patient who was uh, who it was different patients IV uh, drug ad, ad, just uh, ad, ad, abused patient and he was bad endocarditis where was one uh, neoliflet was totally destroyed and I re re replaced this with a mechanical one. And, uh, and there is no more any incidence of back endocarditis in my uh, uh, 87 patients. Another replacement, which was young man, I uh, think it was a not good indication because bulbus was a little bit aneurysmatous and it failed very soon. So it, I replaced this also after Lisbon, I replaced this also with mechanical valve and he's doing well. But, but uh, retrospectively, when I look, it was uh, my mistake and I, it was not good candidate for uh, Aveneo. And mm -hmm. no, um, one patient uh, two months ago died of, with, uh, after COVID infection. And it's not very uh, big number of cases and I, I have, I am very sensitive and our echoscopy, echocardiographists and cardiologists always um, react to me to, to when a patient comes for a consultation. And I did not hear any problem from, uh, from uh, this uh, group of patients. Okay, that's fantastic. So we have out of our 170 cases, we have five or six endocarditis patients who develop an endocarditis after AV neo within a time frame of uh, three months to 2.5 years or something like that. So different, uh, different uh, times after the primary surgery for AV neo. That's why uh, I wouldn't support your last statement um, in general that autologous pericardium is more safe than um, a biological procedures because I think we just do not know that numbers are too small to have really a statistical answer on that, how often that will happen in the future if somebody is treated only by, um, by um, AV neo or compared that to a biological procedures for that. For that answer, we need much larger numbers coming from prospective randomized studies, if it's possible to have that, to have really a number um, which can compare that. I would like to make a small comment, uh, Professor Kranet, that I would not say that these just leaflets are more safe. I would say that generally, because the Ozaki procedure has no artificial tissue cuff, in that uh, direction, I, I think this is feeling, my feeling is more confident to there's no risk, but otherwise as a leaflet, leaflets, of course this uh, stationarily uh, treated uh, biological wall leaflets could be more, even without, uh, by eyes you see that it's there, it's smooth, they look much more smooth than, <laughs> Uh, our, our autologous pericardium, which we treat for half an hour. No, I, I mean only this cuff, artificial tissue cuff, which you see. So otherwise, no. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, both Professor Crane and Professor B. <laughs> for your uh, presentations and comments. We have about... Uh, uh, 10 questions so far that uh, have come up. So we'll just try to, uh, to go through them sequentially. So one question uh, to Dr. Crane is about drawing the, the new suture lines for the new commissure. Do you have any, any tips? Uh, it's quite, quite difficult, I think, to kind of 
imagine what that new uh, annulus line is going to look like for the new commissure. Uh, and you talked about drawing it. Do you have any tips for the other surgeons online? So I can try to explain that again, or I can show the video again, what, what you prefer. Um, everything starts with sizing from my point of view. You have to be absolutely sure how to do the configuration of the new valve and where to put the new neo commissioner that you have a symmetric distribution of your new leaflets at the end. And as you have seen in the video, what, what I'm doing usually is that I definitely measure and take time for that, definitely measure the native sizes so that I have at the end an idea of the native sizes of all three um, uh, commissures or leaflets. And if you have a distribution of a 25 and a 27 and a 31, then you have an idea what is the largest one, which I have to do smaller, which I have to enlarge. The next step in this procedure is that I try to use a different sizer for the leaflets, which I think I have to enlarge. And then I just mark that by a dot, as you have seen in the video. So there you can see that I just marked it with a dot not to get too much confused. And then I measure again. Then I measure again with the sizes I think I would like to implant. And that you have seen also in the video. The next step was I just measure again with this dot as a possible neo commissioner and try to see if this fits now. And if I'm at that place, then I try to draw, and I'm not a very good artist, I have to say, then I try to draw how my suture line from the commissure would be. And in this case, you will see this suture line will pass the native annulus line and go down below the neo commissure towards the new nadir. The new nadir um, will be sized before I starting to draw the suture line because you have then two orientations. You have the new nadir and you have the dot from your neo commissure which you wanna create at that point. If you want, I can show the video again. Perhaps that's easier. Um, yeah, I think it would be helpful uh, if you if you could bring that up because then I think it's an important part of doing the bicuspid valve is is you know being able to have those lines drawn properly. Yeah, that's that's why we uh, definitely included that into the presentation. And so you can see that here and I will stop that by time. So the white coronary cusp is a 29 and you can see here for the non coronary cusp, it's a 20, a 31. And you can see here from one commissure to the other, it's probably a 25, it could be a 23, but um, I usually Ozaki is recommending if you are between two sizes, then use the larger one. So this is probably, something between a 23 and a 25, and I decided to go for a 25. So, but this is, here you can see the coronary ostia. This is uh, the smaller, and this is typically um, the smallest one. It's the left coronary cusp. So if you then go on, then you can see what I'm doing here is, I just mark it for a 27. So one size bigger. Coming the distance from this commissure to my dot would be something here. So if you have that, then you go for your new size for the non-coronary cusp. And as you remember, in the first step, we have had a 31. So I made that smaller because I shifted the commissure from here to this dot. In this case, a 29 is hopefully sufficient. And you can see one here and one there. Okay, that's too late. <laughs> Perhaps that was not good enough on the video. We go a little bit back. Yeah. So one is sitting here, 29 goes around and comes up with that point, more or less. So probably it's not uh, perfect on the millimeter, but 
uh, as as good as you can do that for a movie. Oh, that that was bad. Mm. We we start again. Okay, that was that. Mm. Twenty nine, and then the next step is this is again the twenty seven. And here I mark the new nadir of the 27. You, you see here is the dot, it comes up here. So the next is you have your dot and now you have your nadir. And if you have that, then you have two points for orientation. Here, here you can see that very well. Here's the new nadir, here's the new neocommissar. And now you can, like an artist, try to draw the, the way you have to go to this place. And then you see my difficulties to draw. <laughs> <laughs> then we can just start to implant at this point of the nadir. And then you can do the implantation following this line. Great. Thank you. Perhaps this explains it a little bit how to measure, how to size. And this, this of course, takes some time, but at the end, you will be happy about to invest this kind of time to uh, have a symmetric valve at the end. Yeah, if so you they... need 120 or 110 minutes, or as Dr. B, he, he's doing that in 80 minutes cross plan time. Minutes, I never yeah. did that. <laughs> no, I'm way too slow. <laughs> I saw that in his, on his slide. That was very quick. Oh, yeah, no, the, we, no, we also, we no, did never have- Never 80 minutes. No, never 80 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was Italian guy, <laughs> Marcos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he can do that in 60. <laughs> yeah. um, there is a There was one question, Professor Crane or Dr. Bakadzvili, um, about the, the time difference between AV Neo and uh, aortic valve repair. And, you know, what it obviously, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is, is there a big difference between the two? And, and would you choose to do one method over the other just because of the, the cross clamp time that you, you might have to endure? So um, in, in general, I have to say if my uh, concern would be the cross clamp time in this patient, then I would go for aortic valve replacement. This is done in 30 minutes. Um, no, I think it's not a problem. Uh, our mean cross clamp time in this uh, small study, which I have shown to you, or in our published paper is around 60 to 80 minutes cross clamp time for a repair, depending of course on how much you have to work on the valve to get it competent. Um, if I do an Ozaki, my cross clamp time for an isolated aortic valve is something between 100 and 110 minutes cross clamp time. And we do not see any problems postoperatively just because of a longer cross clamp time. If the operation at all works fine and the valve is competent at the end without a gradient and you have not created other problems doing surgery, then a cross clamp time of 100 minutes is not a problem for this patient population. Definitely not. Okay. Dr. B, how do you, what do you think? Yes, it's a... <clears throat> Uh, cross clamp time for Aven Avenio is I am agreed with Dr. Akrani uh, that it is same about 100 110 minutes for for a isolated aortic valve, and this, this last case was much uh, much quicker because of this uh, 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 to cut the aortic valve it did not take any time it was practically. <laughs> <laughs> practically ready for for implantation only at this moment otherwise it's very very seldom below 90 minutes very very seldom. helpful for the patient <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> for doctor and but uh, about uh, well, uh, aortic wall repair it depends how it's how much it's complicated and uh, if it's not simple repair, I don't like to go because with my experience, it does not give long-term results. 
if it's uh, if we call um, our tequal repair for reimplantation, it takes more than two hour, two hours, of course, David's procedure. But simple well, um, if it's only this uh, uh, yeah. ring and the uh, application of the uh, leaf, leaflets, it depends also how uh, how. Um, Complicated is this, this patient. Yeah. I would sure. say honestly that I don't do much uh, simple aortic valve repair if it if, if it's it's uh, if it's not together with uh, uh, aortic bulbous aneurysm and uh, it's uh, this uh, David procedure is also one of the, my favorite uh, uh, operations. So, yeah. but it is it's much longer. It takes more than two hours. So yeah. they, sorry, because perhaps there's a misunderstanding. When, when I talked also during my talk about repair, then I mean in every case, uh, isolated aortic valve repair without reimplantation. Mm -hmm. So no David procedures in that. Correct. So these are just patients with a normal root and an aortic valve insufficiency. I understand. And we published these results last year. It's a little bit more than 100 patients in total, and 61 of them has a bicuspid aortic valve morphology. And they were treated by annulus reconstruction using subcommissural annulus T sutures. They were placated, patches were used, or something has been resected from the leaflets, and the defect was closed again. So different repair strategies, but Everything I was talking about is only isolated aortic valve repair without manipulating the wood. So this is a completely different patient population, um, in my opinion. So we excluded that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was there was there was one question about the repair strategies if there was remodeling or reimplantation. So. I think you've answered that. So, in doing the AV Neo, do you do you do anything to treat the annulus? Professor Crony? So, um, no, we, we <laughs> the answer is very short. So we, we didn't do an AV Neo anything to the annulus. Um, this is a question with, which comes up uh, very often because usually in bicuspid aortic valves, also you have a larger annulus compared to tricuspid aortic valves. Um, and if you go for a repair strategy, of course, you have to treat the annulus because you have to create a co-optation of the leaflets again by what you have, by your native valve. And you have to anyhow get a good co-optation line there, which lasts long. If you compare that to the AV Neo procedure, then it's a little bit different because just because of the technique, you create a co-optation line and you have seen that in the movies from Professor B. I can't tell the name too. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> I can't pronounce that very good. <laughs> but you, you have seen in, this, in his very well movies and echoes that he has a huge co-optation line. And my hope is, I do not know that, but if you should have, and nobody knows if the ring will um, increase and large very much over time. But if it would happen, then you probably will lose something from your cooptation line. But hopefully, the valve won't get incompetent again. Is that answering enough? That's why we do nothing to the annulus. Yeah. So at least we in the German heart center. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that. I think that definitely answers answers that question. Um, so I th there's one comment that um, Dr. Chu made out onto the group, which is uh, about- Oh, Danny the, is in the group. Yes, he's, okay. he's here. He, and um, let's see, we can get Dr. Chu unmuted here if he's- uh... Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, hello, Dr. Chu, how are you? Hey, how are good. you? Good. good, good to see everybody. Um, yeah, great. First of all, great presentations by both highly respected professors internationally. And um, I, I completely agree with both of your presentations and technical aspects and, and, and the little tricks. 
couple of comments I just want to provide for the group. It may be helpful based on my limited experience with bicuspid valves is, is it's, it's impressive that all of us who do this understand that the pacemaker implantation rate is nearly zero. So um, keep that, keeping that in mind, when you dealing with a Severs type zero bicuspid valve, uh, namely just two commissures, I, I will always try your best, uh, if I may suggest, to keep the AV nodal commissure constant. Uh, because if you have to move that, by definition, you will be suturing along the uh, AV nodal conduction fibers. So, so once you pick one commissure that's constant, the, the decision to form you two other commissures would then come from where the coronaries are. And the coronary osteas are, are not constant. Everybody is, is born differently. So uh, at one occasion, I actually had to relocate the left coronary to the new non-coronary cusp area. So the left-sided coronary, um, uh, uh, left-sided cusp has no coronary. So we really have to kind of let the anesthesiologist know after echo so they can kind of expect that. So that was one comment. Another comment is, and I, I think somebody suggested that having such long suture line along the non-traditional annulus sometimes could be friable and that's a great point. And I, I will say that when you're dealing with a truly reconstructed Seaver Zero, when you have really long suture lines along a non-anatomic annulus, you have to take really big bites sometimes in the muscle and especially so when you're sewing along the aortic sinus. If you take you know, partial thickness bites that will come loose. So really, really take full thickness bites on the aorta. And Professor Ozaki actually recommended having additional 6 sutures to reinforce the newly created commissure along the winged area. And that I, I, I will often do um, because there's studies performed by himself and others that the most stresses are on the AV nodal commissure areas. Um, but that, that's about sort of what, for my limited experience and what, what I, I would suggest for the group. But again, thank you very much for, for presentation by both. Thanks, Professor Chu. Always a pleasure to, to have you join us and, and, and join in the conversation. Uh, we, we trust your opinion highly, so thank you for doing that. Uh, one of the things that uh, Professor Chu said that, and it was a question to um, Dr. Crane about doing the, the, the bicuspid valve was, is there any difference in the sutures whether it's the needle size or the thickness of the, of the suture that you're doing when you're doing a tricuspid versus uh, a bicuspid? No, so, no difference in suture material yeah. at all. Yeah. So the same, the patient... I use the same suture, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I use the same suture as well. Okay. That's good. So, so we both agree to the same. That's good. So we <laughs> <laughs> have a group of two. <laughs> that's yeah, very that's, good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, just because uh, your same suture, same technique, um, no difference. You, you you just move the line where you are suturing to a different place. But um, if I can can uh, give a short comment on what uh, Danny Chu said before, um, I have one case with the same problem that uh, it appears at the end, but I have had the problem with the right coronary artery. The right coronary artery was sitting later on uh, in my non-coronary sinus. So um, this is quite interesting. If you if you have this anatomy of the or the different anatomy of the coronary ostia in this bicuspid or that you stay away from the conduction system. So Professor Crane, I'm sorry, you, you, your connection dropped out right as you were oh. started to talk about that. So can you repeat that? Uh, can you hear me again? Yeah, we can hear you fine now. Okay, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm able to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> I will try it. <laughs> so I, I just want to add a comment to, to Danny Chu because he uh, talked about the relocation of a coronary ostia. 
And that happens one to me too, that we end up with the white coronary ostia in the non coronary sinus, because we have to rearrange everything a little bit. Um, so this, this could happen because um, the orientation of the coronary ostia are so uh, non-standardized in bicuspid aortic valves, especially in the type zero, that this could be a problem at the end. And you should inform not only your echocardiographist, you should also inform your cardiologist. <laughs> 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 and wrote it in your yeah. operating yeah. Uh, procedure Notes. then. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. There will be a time they, that they have to show the ostia. <laughs> yeah, there will be a, a so big very, su very, surprise. Very, very good comments from Danny too, and very important in this scenario. Yeah, thank you. Um, one question about, and it comes up, I think in almost every time we, we have these uh, webinars, is about the, the dilated ascending aorta. So um, question to you, Dr. Uh, Crane is, you know, when, when do you make a determination as to when to replace that versus when do you leave it alone and only replace the, the, the aortic valve? So we, we just follow the general guidelines in this case. So um, if the ascending aorta is above 45 millimeter in bicuspid aortic valves, we definitely replace that. Um, during the last year or two, um, if, if a ascending aorta is something like 40, 41, or something like that in a bicuspid valve, I talk to the patient, I explain to him that it's not guideline confirmed but I would recommend to replace that if I have the imagination that the wall is very thin. So we, we, we're getting a little bit more aggressive to replace the ascending aorta, not get into this trouble that you have later on mm. a reoperation because of that. Um, yeah, that, that's the only thing I can tell you for that point. So go for that, like the guidelines uh, uh, recommend that. And uh, usually it's not a problem to do that. And your, um, your view to the valve and uh, where you have to do the AV neo is usually much better if you first have to dissect the ascending aorta. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Bakhatsvili, would you have a comment? Yes, it's very, very it's, uh, concerning of the guidelines. If it's more than far for 45 millimeters, uh, I replace aorta. It's in my uh, number of cases, I, as I remember, th three or four such a cases I had when it was necessary uh, to replace aorta uh, after sinotubular uh, junction to the, to the ascending, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, medium part of ascending aorta. Okay, so th only it's only three or four out of Please. your 87 yes. cases, huh? That's yes. low. Professor Crane, oh. how, what percentage I, would you say? I, I would say we have something like 30, 35. So oh, a lot like, more. Yeah, 25% of your total patients. Yeah. Okay. So we have around 40% of concomitant procedures mm. and the uh, most one is replacement of the ascending aorta. Okay, great. Uh, we have restrictions for a uh, local um, regulation that if it's aorta, aorta, aorta is not real aneurysmatose, uh, we, we do uh, this hospital would have some problem with uh, uh, state financiation. So. Mm -hmm. Is this um, below less than 45 millimeters, even if we see to, that it is not uh, dilated, but there is tissue is not uh, good and better to replace, we should make many experiments of for, to, mm. to uh, prove that it is necessary to replace. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. It, yeah, we see that, we see that uh, around the world, there's, you know, obvious various countries have different regulations on reimbursement and things. So it's, there, are, there are definitely differences from country to country. The next uh, topic or question is, um, Dr. Avis has a, a question about, uh, specifically about a, a patient, a 
19 year old patient with a bicuspid valve has a peak gradient of 110 millimeters of mercury. And he's asked to, to do the AV Neo. Do you, how do you feel about that? 19 year old male um, with a peak bicuspid valve with a 110 millimeter peak gradient. Dr. Davis, do you want to add any more? Uh, yes, please. So my regards to everyone. Uh, this is a 19 year old male who asked, uh, asked me to uh, do Ozaki procedure. Uh, the thing is uh, that I, uh, I'm not sure if uh, there is any experience with this age of patients. Uh, I just, uh, I would like to ask if anyone uh, has any experience, should I suggest or force him to go for a Zaki? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, I'm not sure about the metabolism for this age of patients. Should it take uh, five years, 10 years? I don't know, uh, any uh, ideas in these regards? So, uh, I mean, regarding a calcification of the, yeah. or degeneration of the neocasps. Yeah. Yeah, these are a lot of questions in one question, I would say. <laughs> yes. Um, of course. So could you treat a 19 year old patient suffering from an aortic valve stenosis with AV Neo? I would say, yes, you can, of course. Um, it's a uh, adult patient. It's um, outgrowth. It uh, has a stenotic valve. It's bicuspid. You can tricuspidize uh, this patient. So th there shouldn't be an issue not to do that from a technical point of view. And um, the other part is um, to say something about doability. And this is probably a very complex answer. Um, if I, I, I did this kind of patient, so my youngest patient was uh, 13 years of age. So even younger and even not outgrown, but um, I have a couple of uh, patients who are 20 years or 25 years in this age range. Um, and when, I, when I'm talking to these patients, I every time tell them that the valve won't last forever. So I explain to them that the biological procedures in their cases would last probably around five years. This is what we can statistically wise tell them. Um, and if they have some sports or whatever, which they really want to do, contact sports or how, and they would like to be or go for the risk to be operated for a second time but do not have to take referee then these patients often say okay i will go for an ozaki because i know i will just have five years with the biological procedures and i take the risk of an ozaki not knowing how long that lasts but oh. perhaps longer than a biological valve but what I want from my life definitely is not using anything for anticoagulation because yeah. I would like to go for my sports. I would like to go climbing, mountain biking, downhill or whatever kind of stuff. And um, but, but you have to be open, trustful, honestly, and try to explain the situation, I guess, because nobody in the chat and nobody in the world knows how long an Ozaki and AB Neo lasts in a 19 year old. So there are two questions. The question technically wise is easy. You can do the question how to talk to the patient and what is the best recommendation for this kind of patient. This is difficult. I'm so totally okay, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes I am totally agree with Marcus and um, uh, 
I have also one one experience with 17 years old man, a guy, but he was a little with limited disabilities, and to take the warfare for him would be, uh, would create a, a lot of problems. So it's uh, three years after this operation, as I remember exactly. I, I could not look before, and uh, he he's doing it normally until now. But okay, his parents we know about uh, that. This is not. Uh, this is limited time, and how long it passed, nobody knows. We cannot say, but it would it will, would be this time without warfare. Thank you very much for your comments. Of course, I talked to this patient uh, just yesterday and promised him to discuss it with you. I, <laughs> <laughs> I just, just told okay. him that uh, just tomorrow I'm going to have a webinar and uh, so um, thank you very much. I have another question regarding uh, the bicuspid uh, valves. Uh, uh, Marcus, when you uh, show the drawing when you move the uh, commissure, the actual drawing line is not a real curve. It's, uh, it, ha it has uh, some uh, quadriangular shape. Is it real suture line where uh, we should uh, suture or it's just drawing? Is it clear my question? I, no, I didn't get that exactly. Perhaps so, it's by my limited uh, artist capacity. No, no, no. <laughs> you show the picture. Oh, what do you mean? You, you show the picture where the picture. you have two big commissures and one small in the middle. And you, you have a drawing line. Yeah, so that I think it's be it's where you're, you're when you're moving the the nadir over to the left, the the one the new commissure or the new annulus line that you draw is quite flat. Okay, so is, I will is, go so, back to my presentation, and you mean yes. this? Yes. Yes, that's right. I, I, I'm just so this is just uh, by my I... limit. This is just by my limited capacities drawing something in in, in Word. In, in PowerPoint, so yeah. this shouldn't be as so it, it should be like the normal sinus, a little bit more wild. Okay, so concavity should be clear, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As 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 good okay. as you can do that. You have seen that in the movie that it's not that easy to to draw yeah. with the uh, pencils we have with the um, with the fluids around there. Um, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it's just uh, some tool to, to have an idea how to do that. But this is, at the end, this is the most artist part of the procedure. If you just have to follow the, the native annulus, this is, this is more or less quite easy just to follow the rules which Ozaki defined to suture mm -hmm. the, the valve in. But as soon as you have to get out of the normal anatom anatomy, um, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. And of course, you, you, you should try to have that as much concave or at, as much nature-like as possible. Uh, if, uh, can I ask one more question? Very short. The last one, no. <laughs> Go the ahead. last one, <laughs> So uh, my last patient, 74 year old male, so uh, he now uh, has three different sizes of uh, leaflets, 27, 29, and 31. He had, a, had an operation about three weeks ago. What should I expect with these three different sizes? Mm. The result is uh, great. No regurgitation, no gradient. Probably nothing. So. Um... The original recommendation, at, at least uh, to my person, person from Professor Ozaki, was uh, two sizes of difference are okay. Um, one of my four intraoperative uh, conversions was due to a too small leaflet on the left coronary cusp uh -huh. compared to two leaflets from the non and the right coronary cusp. Um, 
the non and white coin a cusp was as i remember as 31 and the 31 and the left coin a cusp was the 27. in this case after weaning from from bypass we have had the problem that the two larger cusps are going and moving the left coronary cusp every time towards the left coronary ostia. And by that, the patient becomes instable every time when we try to wean him from bypass. So at that point, we decided not to go for the rule to have one size and two sizes of difference, excepting for whatever you are measuring. We mm -hmm. are just going for one size difference. And if you, if we would have followed this rule, we would have implanting at least one neocommissure at any point. Perhaps it was a sizing mistake, but uh, that was the time when we started and you, and when the time is there that you get more comfortable to doing neocommissures, then you will agree to the fact that as more symmetry you can achieve in the patient as better for the opening area. And um, but but it's definitely not a problem to answer your, your question to have a 27 or 29 and a 31. Okay, thank you very much. Of course, you have hey, I'm done. <laughs> 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 thank you, Dr. Davis. Always a pleasure to see you. So thank you for joining us again. Uh, one final one final question, I guess I, I will ask, and there's a question about treating an enlarged AV junction. Um, would you treat that with AV Neo or would you use some other procedure? Hmm. This, this needs a definition. Is, is the person still online? Uh, who that she or he can explain a little bit more what he means. Uh, let's see. Sorry, don't. I had a similar question. If the sinus sinus of Valsalva is more than forty-five millimeter, uh, 50, 55, uh, yeah. there is, and there is a clear indication to replace the sinus as well. Would you recommend an avenue procedure? And what do you think uh, for uh, conduit with avenue? What's your yeah. opinion for that? Maybe, maybe it's a, good... a premature uh, idea, but uh, I think uh, in the uh, recent future, uh, we will face uh, these kind of operations as well. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, um... I know that it's technically wise possible first to suture an AV Neo into a procedures and then implant the procedures. I have seen that from some guys from India, I guess. Um, we are not doing that. So in case of an aneurysm in this place, we and you have an insufficient aortic valve, we are going for the David procedure, and this works quite good. Otherwise, we usually recommend the Bantal procedure in patients who have a large um, aneurysm of the sinus valsalva, uh, which which needs to be treated. Then we go for replacement with the prosthetic valve and um, an ascending procedures. Um, so. Me on my own, I do not have any experience in that. So as soon as the wood has to be treated, we do not do AV neo procedures. This probably answers your question, isn't it? But the AV junction is the, um, and this is what the first question was about. It's it's below the wood, so it's the uh, atrioventricular junction. So if the annulus probably is meant, if this is the question to the annulus, okay. then it could be, but we do not know a problem that if the annulus is too large, that you get again an incompetent 
AV neo after time. But this is what I try to explain when we compare aortic valve repair, where we definitely know that an annulus of 29 and above is a risk factor for reoperation. We know that from the literature, and this is often being shown. If you have an annulus of 29 and you're doing an AV neo, nobody of us knows what happens because you created a much larger co-optation zone in this kind of patients, which by further annulus dilatation could become less, but that doesn't need to mean that it becomes incompetent. So this, this question couldn't be answered and depends probably also on the size. The only thing which, which you definitely should have in mind is that your largest leaflet is 35 on the template. So far, I never have had the situation that the size of 35 wasn't sufficient to do an AV neo in the patients because of a too large annulus. But um, this is, from my point of view, the only limitation you can have. And um, yeah, if this was a question for the AV junction, I don't know if that is correct, my interpretation. I think, I, yeah, I think that, um, I think that's ex exactly what, what they were talking about. There was also just, I know we just have a, a minute or two left, but a couple of questions on, uh, do you ever do the Bental with AV Neo? It could be good alternative for our biological bental. As the professor Karne told, it could, uh, it's, um, it's necessary to put this uh, pericardial, uh, pericardial cusps in the prosthesis before and after implant bental. I, got, I had this idea, but I could not, I had no, <laughs> have no time to go laboratory to, to check how it works. <laughs> So, but yeah. for biological bental, it could be a good alternative, I think. Yeah, I know Professor Albertini has uh, done done this a couple times now recently. Um, so it, it could be a good topic of conversation for us in the in the future. Yes, Damon, may I ask a question? Yes, which Dr. Allen. Important. Uh, what what are the uh, opinion of the uh, two distinguished uh, surgeons uh, for uh, patients with connective tissue disorder, mm. such as uh, osteogenesis imperfecta or other connective tissue disorders? Uh, I had a uh, such a patient, and we discussed with uh, Dr. Ozaki. It was four years ago, and uh, he said that if it's uh, uh, fine, I mean, by uh, inspection, uh, you go on, but uh, I'm not sure. I do that operation. It was a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta, and now it's his probably fourth year, and he's quite fine. But uh, I want to uh, hear uh, the uh, what do, what do they think? What do they think about this kind of patients, Professor Crane, or? Professor B? Uh, personally, me, I, I try to avoid in such a patient's uh, avenue procedure because this connective tissue could influence also this uh, own pericardium. This is one and uh, durability of the pericardium. In other ways, if um, root of the, not root, but the ventricular aortic the junction would be enlarged more, uh, we could get um, uh, insufficient valve insufficiency, and uh, it would be not. Uh, uh, it would be compromisation of the method, but it would would be. Uh, I think it is not uh, correctly uh, impro correct approach to this disease. I think, Professor Kranny? Mm, that's a good question. I, I never have operated on a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta so far. Um, I, I, I can't tell and, and I don't know how to 
decide intraoperatively if the pericardium is affected by this disorder too. So the only thing what you can do and, and how does it feel? So was it very elastic, the pericardium before you treat that? Uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, how, how did you do the decision if the pericardium is normal or not? So I have no experience with that and couldn't give a recommendation. Dr. Allen, any? Uh, I think it's just uh, in a gray zone. I, I, I also am not sure. And that, that was the reason why I asked the, the, this question yeah. uh, to both uh, Dr. Crane and uh, Dr. B. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I remember what I discussed with uh, Dr. Ozaki. Uh, he said that if if you think that it's pliable uh, and it's uh, that you can manage it easily after uh, ultraaldehyde uh, treatment, uh, you just go on. Uh, but uh, another option was, of course, uh, to use a bovine pericardium instead. But we preferred to use uh, patients' own. Uh, yeah. So just uh, for an anecdote, I want to uh, tell this. Uh, the patient is fine for the four years. And these uh, osteogenesis <laughs> imperfecta patients really are very uh, difficult patients because that patient had a uh, fracture, uh, a 10 or 15, uh, 12 fracture within two years. Wow. And uh, these were all spontaneous fractures with severe uh, bleeding. Uh, and... Uh, why I insisted for his uh, own pericardium in uh, bovine pericardium, we still go on uh, at least uh, aspirin. But uh, as Dr. Ozaki recommends, uh, just stop aspirin after uh, three months, he said. So that was also a very uh, big opportunity for, for the patient. Mm -hmm. but, but how does the pericardium feel? Was it very elastic? No, it was quite normal, like, like every pericardium. Okay. Yeah, no, no, nothing okay. special. I didn't feel anything special. Okay. Well, that's a great, a great result. So interesting. Yeah, something to, to keep in mind as we uh, continue to, um, you know, build the the registry of these types of patients. We we'll, we'll probably will start to see some of this information come out uh, over time. So. I would like to ask a question in a few minutes, uh, if it's possible. Uh, okay. I'm Fahad Rasef. Dr. Fahad, okay. very, very, uh, very yes, quickly. Uh, yes, very quickly. Dr. Crane, how do you explain to do an uh, Ozaki procedure and the leaflet is coopting very well and the TE post-operative, but there is a significant incompetence? How do you explain that? Did you catch the question? Oh, so the, the leaflets looked fine, and in the TE, you have a high degree incompetency. We good. Yes, although it's co-opting very well. Yeah. That, the commissural, commissural regurgitation. Or... Yeah. No, it's central regurgitation. Okay. Maybe the, a fold in the, in the leaflet or something. Yeah, Maybe it's, there are no, no congruency of the leaflet co cooptation or no, no other possibility. Two small leaflets, maybe? Mm. No, it was not. It was the okay. usual uh, view before closure of uh, our totomy. And after I, after surgery with that and uh, TE, the leaflets is coopting very well, the usual. Uh, but there was a significant incompetence. I don't know how. And I asked the, the echocardiographer. He told me the valve looks very fine and the reflex is passing very well and everything is fine, although there is significant central incompetence. Mm. Maybe there is a redundant tissue one in one of the leaflets and it's not good cooperation or no other possibility. Yeah, if everything was co perfect, then it would be competent, I think. Mm-hmm. No, uh, the, 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 the leaflet was fine and was uh, appeared normal leaflets and coopting very well.
but there was central incompetence. I don't know how. So do you have an explanation for that? It doesn't sound like, I mean, with, I don't, I don't, I don't think we have a good explanation. There's obviously something wasn't there is, right, but there is one one possibility. Maybe all three leaflets we are li little bit smaller than uh, necessary. So this co oh. visual cooptation it could be by echo, but in it could be stay ho, ho, it's a place mm. for central jet. This is just ah, my proposition. Ah, I got you. I, I, I got you. Yes, it could so be an explanation. Fine. This is yeah. this is Danny Chu here. If I may offer a quick comment, sure, I'm Danny. not suggesting yeah. I'm not I'm not suggesting an anesthesiologist is uh, I'm not huh. doubting their competence, but but two things that I do personally for these cases, one I give a warm <laughs> shot of cardio. I always use the LV sump so I can apply suction in the left ventricle to assess on a static testing intraoperatively myself. Number two is after I close the aortotomy, I always give a warm shot, no matter what, to assess the physical competency of the newly created valve. <laughs> number Excuse three me, is... Number one, can, can you repeat number one again, please? Yeah, number How one, I always, use, I, I always use the left ventricular sum drain so to apply suction in the LV so that you can, uh -huh. after the valve is reconstructed, you can assess uh -huh. with high degree of suction yeah. How much of valve yes, is being yes, sucked I, down? Uh, okay, it's a very good idea. Yes, it's fine. Yeah. That's right. And number two mm -hmm. is after you close the aortotomy, I always, always give a, a warm shot of cardio, warm blood, to assess high a high pressure system. Number three, yes, after yes. I take the clamp, after I take the clamp off, I, mm -hmm. I will, when the heart starts beating, if you, mm -hmm. if the heart is fully decompressed and you have ejection, significant ejection. No matter what Echo mm. says, you got severe AI. Mm. Okay, if your heart is, if, if your the clamp is off and, and your heart is fully decompressed and you don't have much ejection, I don't care what the echocardiographer mm. tell me. Your your valve is competent. Oh, what, okay. What, what do you because, mean? Because by, what do you mean by, by what do you mean by, by uh, can you repeat the number three? I I, I cannot understand it. Yeah, when number the three is when, beating, beating. yeah, uh -huh. when, when the clamp when the clamp comes off and your yeah. heart starts beating at 50, 60 beats a minute, when the heart is completely decompressed, if you uh -huh. see ejection on the aortic line, that means you have significant mm. degree of AI. Okay. If you uh -huh. don't, uh -huh. if you if you don't, uh -huh. if it's flat line, mm. your valve is mm. good. Okay. And Mm. Keep in mind that when you do a TEE, you could, there's always going to be some degree of AI. This valve is not going to be zero. Uh, my valve, my normal valve has some AI. Everybody does. But it depends on mm -hmm. how you adjust, how you adjust on the echo probe to identify. It could be highly sensitive to, to pick mm -hmm. up some degree of AI, just like a mitral regurge. So, so the, two, the three things I do myself reassures myself. Mm -hmm. That's sort of what I do because ultimately you have to you have to kind of trust your judgment, but that's you mm -hmm. know that's that perhaps that may be helpful in the future. Uh, that's sort of my 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 recommendation for you. Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, very nice, but the third one uh, I cannot uh, I cannot understand this well, so I don't know how to do it. Um, yeah. uh, what does it, what, what do you mean when do we clamp so, the aorta? So when when you're on full total cardiopulmonary bypass, the aorta is clamped. Yeah. When the heart is fully mm -hmm. decompressed, there should not be any ejection. When the when the aortic valve is competent, there shouldn't be mm -hmm. ejection in your aortic line uh, because unless what, what, your aortic uh, valve is not competent. Uh, you mean when when I declamp the aorta and the, the heart right. is fully decompressed and we are still on bypass full flow. Full flow. There shouldn't be any ejection on the aortic lines. If your valve is competent, yeah. if you, if a valve is incompetent, every diastole your valve is going to leak. No amount of LV sum is going to be able to drain the left ventricular volume. That is usually mm. a sign that your valve is probably not good, regardless of what the echo mm. tells you. You know. Oh yeah. yeah. So from a physiologic standpoint, that's sort of what I do. 
Um, yes, anyway. very fine. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. I'm yeah. sorry for the disturbance. And for, <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> So thank you, thank Dr. Fouad, for for uh, for joining us, and thank you for your 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 question. I think it, it's a good question. I'm sure other people will uh, will learn from that. So thank thank you for that. So oh, with no, with, with that, we're going to close this webinar. And uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, we will have the webinar up on our website later this week. So please, uh, if you want to review anything, please go to the AV Neo website and. You will be getting a, a copy of a survey. Please fill out the survey. It, it helps us to improve our webinars for the future. So Professor oh, Krane, yeah. Professor Bakhachvili, thank you very, very much for, uh, <laughs> for your time. And, and Dr. Chu, obviously, thank you very much for, for joining and, and participating. So thank you to everybody. And I uh, would look forward to seeing you next time at the next AV Neo Prestige uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you, See you, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.